Section 8 of The Great Chicago Fire by Various Authors The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies Part 8 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Losses and the Resources of the Companies in the following pages we present a list of all the joint stock fire insurance companies in the United States, except a few unimportant companies in the southern states. The list does not include the small mutual companies, which are confined to country towns and a limited business mainly of farmhouse risks, since such companies are not to be counted upon for the transaction of a general business. The list also contains a complete record of all the foreign fire insurance companies which transact a general business in this country. These lists have been carefully compiled from official sources, and the statement of assets of the companies, in each instance, is in accordance with the returns made under oath to the heads of insurance departments of the various states, and by those officials approved as correct after due examination. The statements of losses have been gathered from sources equally to be relied on. We have been especially careful to secure the exact figures, and so far as given they may be relied on. We are receiving fresh information hourly from our office in Chicago, which has been reopened at 450 State Street, and shall issue daily editions of this publication until the record is complete. The use of these facts and figures will be at once apparent to the businessman, who will today realize, as he has never realized before, that without reliable substantial insurance, his house is indeed but built upon loose sand, and his business hangs in the balance, at the mercy of the merciless element fire. Without insurance, no businessman in this country stands upon a secure footing. Without it, he may be utterly and hopelessly ruined in an hour. The present emergency will doubtless prove of value to him for all time to come, in that it impresses upon him, with a force that he never has hitherto felt, the necessity and the indispensableness of the protection afforded by insurance. In this terrible emergency, it behooves the prudent man to look to it, without a moment's delay, that his property is placed beyond the possibility of loss. The information we give herewith will afford an intelligent guide as to the course he shall pursue and the companies he shall trust with the most important interests he has in the world. And let us remind the public that it is now no time to haggle about rates. Rates have been too low, and the mushroom companies which pushed the rate below the point of safety in the past have been swept away. The public must not expect that the good companies, which have been so severely tried in this great disaster, will longer continue to stand between new and irretrievable loss for a premium which affords a paltry margin. They must be remunerated for the blow which has been inflicted upon them, and the public must expect to pay at least double the rate which they have hitherto paid if they expect to be insured. And now, one word in behalf of the companies. Although there are a limited few which can boast of a heavy capital, past experience shows that the majority are to be relied on under the severest strain. The great fire of 35 which swept New York, the Portland disaster, and now the calamity of Chicago, prove abundantly their elasticity and ability to meet the heaviest drain upon them. There is no financial institution endowed with such recuperative energies, and they meet the claims upon them as a class with the most decided and praiseworthy promptness. The public can see from the papers as they are daily issued how nobly the fire underwriters of this country are meeting the present crisis, and we submit that they are entitled to the largest degree of public confidence and the most generous public support. Let no one try to beat down the rates they fix upon the risks offered to them. Their offices are overcrowded, their hands are full. They will demand no more than they are justified in asking, and it is every insurer's duty to accept without cavil the advanced rate, which the severest experience has rendered it necessary to impose. Note. Here in the text follow eight pages of tables 
in which are listed alphabetically all of the insurance companies referred to in the text, giving for each one its name, the year it was organized, where its head office is located, the amount of its capital, the amount of its assets on January 1, 1871, and the amount of its losses in the Chicago fire. A final concluding table is a summary, which shows the aggregate loss of all the insurance companies by state, as well as the foreign insurance companies. End note. The Hartford Companies, from the Hartford Courant. The aggregate capital of the Hartford Fire Insurance Companies is $6,100,000. Its market value last week was $12,894,000. The total assets last New Year's Day were $13,287,865. And when the Chicago fire broke out, the total was doubtless at least $14 million. The total income in 1870 was $9,237,821. The market value indicated the confident expectation of stockholders and the market that not less than 10% on that market value, or over a million and a quarter annually, might be expected in dividends. Several millions are going directly from Hartford to Chicago. The depreciation in the present market values of the stocks will doubtless be many millions. It is a terrible loss but there is likewise a grand opportunity, the best of forty years past or of a generation to come, to put our insurance business upon a greatly honorable and greatly profitable basis. Let us take the oldest company, the Hartford, for illustration. It will meet all its obligations without impairing its capital, and doubtless with a large share of its surplus left. But suppose it has lost not alone its surplus of nearly two millions, but its capital of a million also. There could be no better investment for its stockholders than to consider themselves organizing anew, and to take from their pockets another million for new capital, in order to keep the old name going. And they could afford to pay a million for the franchise at that. The same can be said of any Hartford company with an established reputation and a good set of officers. This is the era of new departures, and there is clearly to be a new departure in the business of insurance. There will be certain great advantages over the past. 1. There will be less competition on the part of inferior companies pursuing a weak and narrow-minded policy of very low rates. Many such companies, especially in the West, have ended their course. 2. Rates will necessarily advance, and with the cheerful consent of the insured. Hereafter, people will willingly pay companies that pass this ordeal, not only for the pleasure of holding a policy, but something for the solid assurance of being really protected. Short-sighted men will grumble less at bloated monopolies, after having felt the value of a great surplus rolled up for a day of need. 3. Chicago, and other cities as well, have learned an awful lesson, and there will be greater care in rebuilding, aided by stricter local legislation and more watchful supervision. The hazard will be reduced. 4. Much of the nonsensical and wicked jealousy of foreign companies, as those of sister states are called, will pass away, and with it will go the hostile legislation so directly at war with sound economical principles and the true spirit of unity. End of Section 8 End of the First Pamphlet, The Chicago Fire and the Fire Insurance Companies